Hello, my name is Michael West, and I'm the co-CEO of Biotime and CEO of Ajax Therapeutics. Today we'll be discussing Ajax, and in doing so, I'll be making certain forward-looking statements that have associated risks and uncertainties, and so we refer our viewers to our filings with the Securities and Exchange Commission for more detailed information about the company. Well, thank you, Patrick, for being with me today. Why don't we start with um, some of your background. How did you become interested in this interface between economics and an aging population? I'm a policy economist, a policy wonk. And the focus of people like me has always been on analyzing the economy and coming up with ways to reduce problems and hopefully even to create a situation where everybody becomes better off. We want more fairness, we want, want more wealth, we want people's lives to be better. That's what economists do. And after 20 years or so of studying budget problems, spending problems, you quickly come to the, well, in my case it might not have been quick, but you come to the conclusion that the big driver of all of our economic problems is healthcare in general, which is the largest industrial sector not only in America but in history for all of the Western world. And that is the driver of increased spending. Now, in recent years, what we have begun to see is the demographic transition really having an effect. Now, this was known in the 1930s. The demographer Warren Thompson's book. Population Problems was the standard textbook until the late 60s when uh, I think he was a Stanford entomologist specializing in butterflies wrote a book called The Population Book, predicting that the world would end through starvation and overpopulation. Demographers knew better. And they were predicting something else entirely, which was that the continuation of lifespans is always accompanied by a decrease in birth rates. So what Thompson and other demographers said is, we're going to get a bigger and bigger and more expensive older population with fewer and fewer younger people able to pay down debt. Debt is just sending the bill to the next generation. So now for the first time in history, we've entered a period where every subsequent generation is smaller than the one before. This is utterly new in the human experience, and very few people, including financial analysts, have truly grasped this truth. What it means is this enormous debt that we're building up can't be paid by our children. I'm so irritated at baby boomers who complain about millennials. The millennials have been hosed due to these policies. We're spending, in the United States, 30 cents out of every dollar spent is borrowed, which means that we're putting on a credit card, we can our kids pay, in theory anyway. I'm not sure we can make them pay. So, so at the same time, that 30 cents out of, every, out of every federal dollar spent is a transfer payment to the agent. So this is getting worse and worse, and we're already seeing the results of this. In my profession, very few economists looked at the slowing of economic growth in Japan, the oldest population in the world, saw that, in fact, what was happening is the workforce was diminishing, but the burden of taking care of an increasingly older population was increasing. So that is our challenge. Recently, Alan Greenspan, former head of the Fed, came out and said, uh, there are no economic tweaks. None of the old tools will fix this because the real problem is aging and disease and the like, or something like that, I'm paraphrasing. And what he's talking about is the fact that our aging population is growing, mandated transfer payments to support them are also growing. This is not discretionary spending. This is built into the law about 8% a year. You know, exponential growth. Look at where that takes us while our kids' incomes are falling. Doesn't work. So. As a macroeconomist, it became increasingly evident to me over the years 
that macroeconomics doesn't have a solution. There isn't even a political solution. Unless you think of accelerating biotechnology as a solution. Because what we can do and determines old age dependency ratio. When I was born, there were 17 contributors for every one dependent. As lifespans increased, that has not, and birth rates fell, we now have about three contributors for every dependent. So what we need to do is, first of all, keep people out of the dependent column longer. That means healthy. And, and if we can, put them into the contributor column. And in fact, we know that do, we, we know that we can do that. Just recently, there was a study show, showing that about two out of every three retirees in the United States does so unwillingly for health reasons. Either the worker or the worker's spouse simply cannot allow it. it just demands more care than they can, they can provide, so they're, they're stuck at home. So if what we could do is extend health spans and working careers, despite what people say, we'll do it. I mean, people don't want to retire. They would rather pay for their own way. The unions and the whatever political forces that say it's impossible are simply wrong because it's already happening. So if we can take, in some estimates, by the way, J.L. Shansky, the Milken Institute have looked at this, they're saying only three years more health and, and working career or productivity before you retire would probably solve it. I don't know if that's true, it might be five, but the fact of the matter is we can do much better than that and very quickly. I think that this is coming in several stages. One is more effective disease treatments. This is regenerative medicines through stem cells. There's this whole new area of geroprotection. And I think the most interesting thing in geroprotection is finding out that the Buck Institute realized that even when older animals are given these gyro protectors, rapamycin in particular, they seem to de-age. They became younger, healthier, they were able to operate functionally. So it's not too late for old people. These compounds will work to extend their health span, reduce their medical costs, and to allow them to contribute. But down the road, there are much more powerful biotechnology in the way, and I think that you are the man. And, and this is based on your success. A lot of people are working on this, but you know, it's your work with the creation of embryonic stem cells, telomerase, um, spinal cord injury, the, the cell cure blindness injury. You got the patents. Other people got the credit. But if they had really done the work, they'd have the patents. You have an unparalleled history of success in this field now that you have gone on to induce tissue regeneration. Um, I don't know if I said explain that here. That's really your, your, your area. But I mean, if you could, briefly. I'd... I appreciate the, the kind comments. But the, the, the reason I've been motivated to work in these areas is, well, I guess concern about the individual human being. You know, I think we all have people we care for, and I've seen the impact of aging on their health. My father had heart disease for a number of years, uh, had uh, you know, bypass surgery successfully once, unsuccessfully once, and uh, you know, we want to see our loved ones age better. And then when you began expanding that out, what concerned me, I'd like to know if you share this point of view, not only do we have an increasing percentage of people that are old, and a smaller workforce to support them, and the economic strains that generates. But we have this surge, like a tsunami coming to our shores because of this baby boom phenomenon. I guess about 76 million American 